Harlem Renaissance was a period of time where uh, you basically had uh, a really um, big push in the arts. A lot of people talk about the Harlem Renaissance and, and a lot of the jazz musicians, and that's you know really well documented. But uh, when you talk about the Harlem Renaissance, and you, you speak about, of course, the music, you speak about dance, you speak about poetry, um, uh, visual art, you know, so it's, it's, the Harlem Renaissance really is more of an arts in general sort of thing. Now, within that, and you talk about jazz or just music, um, uh, you get into the, the likes of people like Duke Ellington, and uh, some of the big bands that were, were coming up. With Duke Ellington, it starts with, in, in, the, in the Harlem Renaissance, it starts with the Cotton Club. You know, uh, that's a very famous ballroom in which Duke Ellington and his band would uh, present uh, the music. And they had dancers, and uh, it was just an amazing time. Um, there's a there's kind of a connection to Charleston with the Harlem Renaissance, uh, being that it is in Harlem. There was this huge migration of African Americans uh, from the Charleston area that moved up to New York and settled in Harlem. You know, so uh, there was a there was a very big uh, Southern you know Charleston you know sort of connection and a, and a flavor. Um, I like uh, one of the stories that that I came across. Um, just in listening to some of my mentors talk was about um, uh, the famous um, pianist named James P. Johnson who wrote a song called The Charleston. Now James P. Johnson is actually from New Jersey. However, in Harlem they would have these things called house rent parties and at house rent parties you would have entertainment and people would come in and they would give a little money to help somebody with their rent, house rent party. And um, uh, it was a well-known fact that a lot of the musicians that were up there during this time were musicians from down here in the South, more, more specifically from the Charleston area or from South Carolina in general. And in Charleston, we have the Gullah tradition. And in that Gullah tradition, you have that Gullah rhythm that and it's our belief, I say our being Charlestonian, it's our belief that James P. Johnson was uh, in attendance at a lot of these hard Harlem, you know, parties, these house rent parties, and he heard that beat. Same beat. So, um, with regards to uh, the Harlem Renaissance being important, um, just artistically, um, you've got to talk about some of that low country flavor. <laughs> Improvisation. In jazz, when you improvise, you are just basically you're making it up. Uh, the the word improvisation or improvise means to basically uh, just make it up off the top of your head, and that's what the essence of jazz is. You have a song that was written by uh, someone that composed it, and you expand on whatever that song, you know, actually is. Um, if I were to tell you a story, and I were to say. Uh, like, um, after school I went home, I had a snack, I did my homework, I watched TV, I had dinner, I went to bed. Now I'm going to tell that same story again. After school I rode the bus home, talked with my friends, I got home, I made a snack, it was a sandwich, I decided to do my homework, it was math. Uh, I watched TV, Spongebob was on. Um, after that, we had SpaghettiOs for dinner. I took a bubble bath and then I went to bed. I'll tell the story again. After school, I rode the bus home. We talked about how, every, how everything in class went well and that horrible pizza that they served us at lunch. I got home, I made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm adding more to it. With music, and uh, actually we can trace it back to our uh, 
our brothers and sisters that were in the Jenkins Orphanage, the way that they expanded upon the music and added on to the music was extremely important to the growth of jazz. And during the Harlem Renaissance period, it was just a continuing sort of progression. You know, there was always someone that was going to come up with something, you know, new and unique to add on to whatever was happening with the music at that particular time. Um, uh, during the Harlem Renaissance, uh, the big sort of thing was swing music, big bands. Duke Ellington had his band, Count Basie had his band, Fletcher Henderson had his band, and you had people that were in his band or in these bands that were, uh, that had connections to Charleston or the state of South Carolina. Um, one of the more uh, radical musicians from this time period uh, was a young man named Dizzy Gillespie who used to play in some of these big bands. And eventually, Dizzy decided that he was going to switch it up and he had a smaller ensemble that invented this new style of music called bebop, which just was radically different from having your band of you know, 15 to 18 people to now down to five people, and the music was fast and furious and just great. So when we talk about the evolution or the, the progression or, you know, how improvisation uh, went through the Harlem Renaissance, it was just sort of a natural thing. Everybody sort of expands on what is presented there. They, uh, they listen, they uh, educate themselves with that style of music or whatever is happening then, and then they try to add on to it. And so um, that was just a natural uh, progression of the way things went during that time. <laughs> African-Americans uh, leading the way in jazz? Um, that's a tough question. However, um, with uh, African-Americans and their experiences, with their uh, natural ability to improvise in many situations, um, with their uh, ability to be extremely creative, with uh, whatever was presented in front of them. Um, that, all of that could be translated into entertainment, whether or not if they were singing, whether or not they were playing an instrument, whether they were um, you know, just uh, dancing, you know, anything of that sort. Um, you, know, you, could, uh, you could dance out your feelings, you could play you know, something, you could, you, could, uh, you could sing how you were um, feeling at that particular time. Um, in church, for example, there is uh, a term that we use called raising up a song. And when you raise up a song, you basically just start singing whatever it is you're feeling at that particular moment. And nine times out of ten, um, the rest of the congregation is probably not going to know that song because you're literally just making it up. It's, it's so you at that particular moment. But eventually, um, that song comes back around. It comes, it, it, it's sung over and over. And after a while, it, it's sort of the, the song that that person is actually known for. Um, my grandfather had a song, you know, and there was a certain part of the, the church service eventually that, you know, it was, well, is is Mr. Fudd gonna sing now? And nobody moved, you know, because, you know, this was this song that, that he had been singing since he was a little boy even. And so, um, with regards to, you know, being sort of the leaders of, of, uh, of the Harlem Renaissance or, or just improvisation, um, you know, African Americans doing that off of their experiences, um, it's almost, an, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a natural thing. Two of my favorite jazz artists from the Harlem Renaissance period, uh, definitely Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald. Duke Ellington because of his just genius. It is said that Duke wrote well over 2,000 compositions. Now, 
Uh, to put that into perspective, um, let's say, let's bring that up to date. Let's say that you wrote uh, a long email to someone. Now, let's say if you wrote a long email, let's say you wrote 2,000 emails. They were all long. They were all to different people, and they all had different content. That's a lot. And you figure um, with Duke, he was very proficient at it. Um, if someone were to ask him, if he could bring the band to perform next week, and he was so inspired, he might just write a whole new suite of music for that occasion next week. Next week, that's, a, that's, that's pretty proficient. And, um, and there were some instances where he would literally pass the music out to his, you know, his, his, his band you know, right on the spot, and they would have to play it right there on the spot. The ink wasn't dry yet, you know, but uh, he was just, he was just incredible like that. And um, everyone respected him for that. Um, I, I saw one time where Dizzy Gillespie said, I think I know quite a bit about jazz, and I think we all, as jazz musicians, have done our, our due diligence and have studied. But whenever we play with Duke Ellington, it's not about what we know anymore. It's all about what Duke knows. And that's saying something. Um, and then of course there's Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald is, in my opinion, and I think uh, there are a lot of other people that share the same opinion, the greatest female vocalist of all time. Uh, there was just simply nothing her, that, that she could not do. Uh, her range was incredible. Her inflections were incredible. Um, she could scat like no other. As, as quick and as ferocious on, on their trumpets and saxophones and clarinets and pianos as some of these musicians were, Ella could outscat them and just like that. She was incredible. And um, for her to have the career that she had uh, starting as a teenager um, was just mind-boggling. Uh, she's clearly, um, you know, uh, just one of the most important musicians of all time, definitely. And, but especially in that growth period of the Harlem Renaissance. So between Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald, they're the best.